so first uh, my background so this PhD is not like oh I'm uh, expert machine learning in machine learning of computer science sorry I'm a biologist so I worked in biomedical research and I love I at that time I didn't know how to code so it was like bench science yeah by painting and stuff and then I learned Python at an uh, intensive boot camp and now I'm a developer, I guess, and I recently started this position as a data scientist. Uh, so what it means in my case is a mixture of background in science research and knowledge in software and web development. Um, a lot of time I ask myself, so what would I have done earlier when I was working in the lab and I didn't know how to code? Now that I, if I had known how to code, what would I have done differently? And so I have several ideas of project and here I will present to you this project. So it's a personal project, it's not something I did at work. Mm. So what's my idea? So I added a PhD comic to illustrate this idea. So uh, as you must know, uh, research scientists have to go through bibliography. It means that uh, quite often they have to read through all of the articles available and find something related to their area. So either as to avoid this kind of situation when well, someone already published what you're working on, so that's too bad. And uh, something else is also, it gives you more background on your subject and can help you to interpret your results. Um, so that's something that takes a lot of time. Um, when a few years ago, it was mostly like we were mostly printing PDF, but I guess now people actually read on their screen, but a lot of people still, I think, find that quite boring time consuming and I was wondering if there's a way to make it faster, better. Um, so what I wanted to do was gather um, information from scientific article from different subcategories. So here, because that's what I know better, I will focus on biology. But uh, gather information from scientific article from different subcategories and be able uh, with a new article to classify it in one of those categories. So how did I plan to execute this project? And here's a chart to explain my idea. So I will have an um, article from one category that I'm calling A and another one calling called B, and using NLP, I was uh, thinking I will get the most frequent terms on in these uh, different categories. And then using uh, machine learning, supervised machine learning, I will be able to build a classifier. So how did I actually do it? So the first step was um, to actually get those articles to start with. So if I want to uh, um, analyze data, how do I get my data? So I was super excited because recently there are lots of things happening in open science, open access. So there, I thought, well, I don't need to worry about having to pay for those articles. They will be available freely online. But the thing is, um, well, there are lots of uh, articles available for free online, but how do I actually get them? So where's the API? Um, I thought eLife Science Journal had an API, but they're saying it's not really, well, they're using it internally for their own thing. And so the solution I found was actually to look into one of their GitHub repository where they have files in XML formats. So that's the easiest way I've identified so far. So I git clone this repository. Um, and try to parse these XML files using beautiful soup. Uh, there are some subjects um, for each article, but sometimes there are several of them. And because I wanted to have um, distinct classes, I only look for the one that has only one uh, subject attached. And I chose uh, the neuroscience um, for one group and the cell biology. Uh, it's like the two groups that have the highest number of articles, so that's why I chose that. And then the second step was to try and retrieve the most important uh, terms from those categories of articles. 
and for that um, how knew how I knew how to like write a simple script using an LTK and Genzim uh, Python library and um, try to uh, implement the TF-IDF model to actually get those terms and here is like um, easy example of how I implemented that, this. Uh, so here I'm taking an example text, importing um, things from the uh, NLTK and Genzim libraries. Uh, then the first step I'm using is so tokenization. So I'm breaking down this text into small elements, uh, lower casing it, also removing stop words, which are considered to be uh, words that are don't carry much meaning, and removing punctuation. So here's the, um, the output for this example. And then the next step is lemmatization or stemmatization. I chose lemmatization. Uh, I, I, yeah, I just chose this one and used a tool from NLTK to do it. So it, I expected, for example, that all the better will be changed to good, but it did not happen. What I noticed is like uh, words that were um, plurals actually came up sing singular, so it works, but there might be like a better way to do it. Um, then in this step, I'm creating, oh yeah, so I'm using the bag of words and uh, using a dictionary from a Genzim library. And on this dictionary object that I create, I call the doc to back of word uh, function. And this is what I retrieve. So I have a list of tuples. And the first uh, element of the tuples is like the index of the word in the document. So in the sentence here, and the second is the frequency of this word. Um, and then, so, oh yeah, I missed that. Uh, that step of uh, actually using the TF-IDF model on the back of word and uh, associating on top of the frequency of the word, the, uh, the proportion of the word in the world document. So first I only have the frequency in this uh, sentence and then I'm also taking into account, well I'm taking, taking into account the length of the document. And in the following step, uh, I'm using the Latin semantic indexing model, which as far as I understand it takes into account the meaning of these uh, words. And so I'm retrieving, um, Oh, we can't see here, it's been cut, but I can, um, when I call the LSI model function, I can give it a number of topics that I want to retrieve, and here I arbitrarily chose to retrieve uh, three topics for each uh, sentence. And uh, using on the LSI object, I can uh, reveal so the, the topics, uh, which is uh, associated with this index, and and I'm actually, um, what I chose to do is not keep this uh, frequency score and only gather all the terms that are most important in, uh, well, here in the text, but uh, for the article. Uh, uh, sorry. Oops. Yeah, I think I was finished. Uh, so still in exec executing my plan and retrieving the most frequent articles. Uh, so then I knew that I could use this script and I had like tons of files, uh, article files. So what I did was, well on one side I converted all this uh, XML, uh, well I passed them and converted them to text files. And then I thought I will uh, build uh, functions instead of having a script so I could uh, call this function on this list of XML files, which is what I did. So here I just loaded my uh, get topic file where I'm actually, so I have more stop words that I used in my example. I kind of didn't know where to stop because when I, I tried this on a 
example of a scientific abstract, and I didn't know when does this word actually bring meaning to the text, or when does it bring nothing to the text. And, but at some point I, I had to stop, so that's where I stopped. And I also had some other problem that I will talk about later, but basically I had to replace the like Greek characters uh, in the text. And so here is how the function I use, which is like, um, if you remember the script just before, so it's just the steps of the script, so parsing the text, getting the tokens, limitation, bag of words, then trying to apply those two statistical models, and um, getting the topics out of them. So just the words and not the score that is uh, linked to it. And here is the function I will call, which basically uh, calls each of the previous function uh, one after the other. And um, so from all the artic article I had, so I parsed them and created uh, directories depending on the subjects, and I'll put the text file in them. So I'm looking in that path for all these articles and creating a list and basically calling um, this function, oops, here the get topic function on that path, and um, and I'm dumping everything in a JSON file to just as a way to, well, to keep it for later for a second step. So I so I don't have that much data. I think that's because I chose to select article that only belong to one subject. So I have less than 200 articles for neuroscience and less than 100 for cell biology. I guess we can discuss that later. And so that's the example of things that are, I retrieved for an article. So some things that seems more, well, some terms uh, obviously seem more scientific than others. But as I said, at some point I had to stop trying to clean the, the text. Um, so here we come to the third step of the process, trying to actually build the classifier. And so I chose to use uh, scikit-learn, which means using NumPy data structure. And here is like what I actually did. So I had my data output it to a JSON file. So I'm going through this JSON file here, and this is just an example. So I have. Um, neuroscience uh, in what part, and then uh, cell biology, and then I have like a dictionary structure with the key being, uh, so a publication ID that I found from a life science journal, um, and then the value associated to it is like a list of uh, all the most frequent topic, well, uh, terms that I got from this article. And then the next step was actually uh, building a NumPy array containing all, containing all of the, um, all of my most frequent words for all of the articles. And um, we can see from here that my idea was that um, for each column will be first uh, all of the publication IDs, then the class it belongs to, so class or subjects, I keep changing words, sorry. So the subjects, either neuroscience or cellular biology. And then as I decided not to take the term frequencies, I will have just a zero or one, um, because I will have for each column all of the words that I found in all of those articles as most frequent in all of these articles, and each row will be an article. And I will have a one if this word is part of the most frequent for this article, or a zero if it's not. I guess it's something that could also be discussed as a strategy. And so that's how it actually looks like. And so the dimension, you can see that there are over, over 2,000 uh, columns uh, in this and over 200 and of rows. I wanted to look at the, have a look at the data, but it's not 
well, it's not really pretty because I, if I plot, I don't have like all of these dots because it's binary data. Um, to give you an example, I try to plot a few of these terms as a, using a bar chart. So here on the x-axis, they're just uh, randomly chosen terms. Uh, so the first one is, for example, detected, then could, because, I don't know, I didn't remove it. And all these words are from the uh, retrieve from some articles. And the colors is the class they belong to, so either cell biology or neuroscience. So some terms are almost equally fine in both, and sometimes some terms, although it means it seems to not bring much meaning, but they are only fine in one category and not the other. So at this point, I thought that maybe it was a, a good way to go. So maybe I would be able to uh, classify these two subjects. I still made some kind of plot, although it's not, um, it's not super informative, but it's still a, a good way to see the data. So on the x-axis, I have the term distinct. And on the y-axis, I have modulation. And for s it's just um, to see that for s some terms, like modulation, they exist, uh, well, they are um, only found in, well, in this data set. They are only found in one type of article, so the neuroscience article. Um, well, no. Ah, they, um, they are most yeah, they are mostly fine in your science article. They are not fine in cell biology articles, and for but they are also uh, absent in some of the neuroscience articles with a lighter red color here. That's what I thought. On and um, then for this term, it's it's also mostly found in one of the category and not of the other. So I don't know, as, as, I, as I said, at that point, I thought like it might, might be uh, a good way to go. Um, going on to the second step of actually building the classifier with those data. Uh, so I tried uh, two algorithms um, that I think are amongst the simplest to uh, implement. So I first I tried the naive base classifier, um, it, which assumed the independence of the features. And in this case, I kind of assumed that the, all the terms were independent. And it's also widely used, so I thought it can be a good approach. And it is used in text class, uh, categorization and classification. So. Yeah, good way to go, and it doesn't require a very large data set, which is my case. Um, and I tried, to, um, I actually chose the Bernoulli uh, naive base classifier, as it's mostly, it is the one uh, mostly used in text categorization, and especially when the data is not continuous, and it's my case, so I have uh, binary data, because I didn't choose Again, I didn't take the term frequencies, but only uh, the absence or presence of the word. Uh, so I'm using uh, scikit-learn and tr uh, using the test, uh, train test split function to separate my data set into training and testing sets. Okay. And yeah, so using uh, the, this model, um, I'm doing the, yeah, I'm using the predict function on the test and actually trying to figure out, so is this model actually um, performant on my type of data? And I thought one of the way to go was looking at the confusion matrix, so that's what I did. And so what I would like to see, obviously, is to have high true positive, which is not the case. And out of around 60 cases, I will have, uh, well, mostly, well, I will have uh, 
so I'm not good at looking at true neg positive, but at true negative. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I'm also, oh yeah, so another way to look at the performance uh, is looking at the classification report and also the accuracy score. So only looking at the accuracy score, which is down here, it looks like, well, I'm not sure, but uh, it seems like it's pretty accurate. And looking uh, here more for at the classification report and looking at the two class. So the zero is for cell biology and one is uh, neuroscience. Um, oh yeah, I forgot to um, to explain just before, but I uh, transform the classes, which were so neuroscience and cell biology, into binary. Uh, so one uh, one is now neuroscience and zero is now cellular biology. And so the precision seems quite high. So meaning uh, in that case that out of articles that are identified of, as neuroscience, uh, a lot of them will actually be a uh, neuroscience article and the other way around. While the recall, uh, out of a uh, biology article, um, out of the biology article, really only a few ones w will be classified as biology articles. So this seems good to classify neuros uh, neuroscience article instead of, and not really the cellular biology article, which I think uh, is due to the fact that there are much more um, neuroscience articles compared to cellular biology article. So that's the second algorithm I tested, uh, Can you ask neighbor? Also because it's easy to implement uh, using scikit-learn. Um, uh, yeah, so it, as you know, it's a way to predict the label of a new point. Oh, okay. Um, from its neighbor. And yeah, it's, it's known to be computationally, computationally demanding, but in my case, because I have such a small data set, I'm, I'm not worried. Uh, so in the same, I'm dividing my data set in the same way as I did for the naive based classifier. And I basically seems to have roughly the same kind of um, results. I have an accuracy just a little less and, oh, okay. No, I, um, no, in this case, I have better recall than precision. So yeah, that's, uh, it's not actually the same results. And after seeing, uh, well, especially, yeah, yesterday evening, so there was this uh, workshop by Elena and Shishun from the Cambridge Coding Academy on validating models. And so I thought I will add this uh, careful cross-validation uh, still using uh, scikit-learn library. Um, and I'm, I'm looking at, so, I'm iterating, iterating, iterating through the randomizing of sampling from two to 20 times and looking at the difference on the, in the, uh, the mean uh, scores, differences between those two models. And um, so what I see is actually in terms of only looking at the accuracy, the naive base classifier seems to be more efficient. And yeah, so the maximum, but the maximum of accuracy seems to be when the, um, the training is done around 10, 10 times. So I just, this is just, um, me trying to think, oh, um, well, there, there is a shuffle, shuffle function, but I thought if I do use the fitting function 10 times, I should have be at the highest accuracy level and quite a low standard deviation. And I just tried again the naive base classifier on two ran well, random articles. They're not really random because I showed them uh, to be thinking they belong to one or the other class. And so what we can see here is I al always retrieve the class one, which is neuroscience, which was shows 
to have a higher precision. And I think it's because I have more data set, more data for it. So the first article I tested for me, it's, uh, and I also find it as a cell biology article, but it turns out uh, the classifier predicted to be a neuroscience article. And the second one on cerebral ischemia, which, okay, it's a neuroscience uh, paper and it turns out to be classified as a neuroscience paper. So I guess it's um, it's time. So what's went wrong? Um, so I started out with this project and I thought it would be easy and fast, but then I spent a lot of time trying to actually get data and cleaning it, and hence my second point, Unicode hurts because I had all of these weird characters that were com keep coming up, so each time I was running my function I had a Unicode encode error, and so, yeah, it took longer than expected, and the performance, I don't know if I can say low, but it's to be improved, obviously, because I'm, when I have, well, I only tested it with two articles in the end, but, yeah, uh, if all of my article comes out as neuroscience article, then I'm not classifying anything. Um, and so, um, in the what next, um, you may have, I guess, more suggestion, but um, I think one of my problem is the quantity of data as well as the quality. So, as I haven't seen any API or any way to get uh, clean like JSON format data anytime soon. I'm thinking the way to go would be maybe to scrap uh, open access articles. Uh, in terms of text analysis, um, it might be better to use term frequencies instead of just binary data. That I'm not sure. Uh, what seems like a way to go is maybe using this word to vector instead of the bag of word and retrieving, uh, which I think lead to the second point, instead of using one word, have a vector of several words. Because especially when I'm retrieving as frequent term an adjective, I want to know which noun it's uh, linked to. So I'm thinking to get more meaning, I should have several words. I'm not sure how many would be more relevant, but several words uh, instead of only one. And yeah, so, yeah, that's it. And uh, because I just said what went wrong, I want to say what's good about it. So for beginners and also non-beginners, I think it's a good thing to have like side projects, uh, personal projects, uh, which is a lot different from work project where you already have like usually a lot of data, although it's also not, the quality is not super good, but it's, also, it's a good way to learn and practice, and yeah, so I encourage you, and before you say that you don't have time, because we never have time, a good solution is um, like me to submit a talk, and when it's accepted, well, then, <laughs> yeah, you have to work on your project. Yeah, that's, that's me on Twitter, and you can look at some code on my GitHub repository for this uh, project. Questions? Yeah. So, you do the classification of articles, and the question is how do you use this classification in order to uh, determine if the article is worth your reading? Yeah, my idea of worth reading is depending on your interest. And, oh yeah, so I forgot to mention, but when I'm saying this is my... Oh, oh wait, wait. Uh, when I'm showing this chart and saying, like, this is my plan of action, but it's like me simplifying the problem at the like lower level. Like the, I have this idea, but where can I start? And my idea was, if you're interested in some things, some specific subject, then how, that's how I will start telling you if this article is interesting for you or not. And then I simply. Yeah, so if your thesis, for example, is on, like for me, on cell death, cell biology, cancer cells, so that's 
this I will be interested in those area. Do, do you but have some citation index of article at the end of, of all the things to understand if this article is popular or not? Oh, that's a good uh, that's a good idea for later, I guess. For now, I'm just using the text in itself, and I yeah I even so I just took the repository and there were lots a uh, whole bunch of articles, but I don't know yeah their popularity. Well, that's a good idea, yeah. Because yeah, obvious. Well, obviously you might want to read like the ones that are the most popular yeah. in your area. Yeah, thank you. Well, I have two questions and one suggestion. Uh, so, for the Kenyan slavers, uh, which values of K uh, gave better performance? Uh, I just try three neighbors, uh, five and fifteen, and three seem to give a better, uh, higher accuracy. So that's the one I showed. Sorry. <coughs> Mm -hmm. Let's say for the features, if you make a more compact representation of the features using mutual information, so you have two classes, trying to compute what are the most important words or tokens for each class, and then picking the first 50 or 100, so you have two classes, then you have a more compact representation for your texts, and you can check if it, perf if it performs better or not. Mm -hmm. and, um, and is it, let's say, if you apply naive Bayes, mm -hmm. and if your features are in IDF, mm -hmm. is still straightforward to compute the likelihood, or we still have to do some transformation? Because with binary features, it works well. Mm -hmm. With the, uh, with the uh, IDF, do we have to do something else? Uh, I'm not sure. I, I thought I will simplify again by not uh, taking the score from the TF-IDF, but only using the words themselves and saying if they're there or not for each article. So I'm not sure, but I would expect there will be another layer of complexity. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, have you tried applying the algorithm on just the abstracts? On just the? Yeah, abstracts. Is it the whole article? It's as much of the article I, as I could get. Yeah, I didn't try. No, I didn't try it only. So when I pass the XML, I try to retrieve as much as possible, which I think, well, depending on what eLife Science the journal puts in their repository. But at least I'm sure I have the abstract because the tag in the XML is abstract, so it's straightforward. And for the rest, I see a lot of uh, results, for sure. Um, I'm not sure if I have the discussion, but for sure I have abstract, I think, introduction and results. But I just took all of it and wrote it to a text file. I didn't write several text files. And I'm taking all of the, yeah. And there was the lady. Yeah. <coughs> Sorry, two slightly related points. Um, one is just a question on, I mean, because I come from humanities, so do you think that oh. what you're doing is sort of intrinsic to what works on scientific papers, or do you think it could be expanded across wide range of disciplines and also to a certain extent as part of that I know that certainly some uh, some disciplines and some um, journals you have to do keywords to specify so do you think you could also use it to look and see if the most appropriate keywords are actually being used or if the keywords are presenting a uh, either an unhelpful mm. or a completely misleading uh, idea of what the article is being Okay, so for the question of if it can be used in other area, well, I hope it could be used in other area. Uh, my assumption at first was for, uh, well, this kind of science that some terms will be more interesting than others, and that's why I wanted to clean it as much as possible. But I guess that may not be the right way to go, and maybe I should stop the trying to clean and keep really scientific terms and just keep the whole of the article. So in this way, I think it should be reproducible with other area. And the second question was, uh, uh, I already forgot. Well, the, when, when you have journals which have keywords attached. Oh yeah, the keyword. So, well, that was one of the idea from the start because when you're doing a search, you can even receive like, 
email alerts for certain topics, but what if it's not classified properly and then you are missing it? Uh, so I'm hoping like that's what I would like it to be, but the problem is here I'm relying on some tags already because I cannot like read myself or have someone, for example, from humanities actually look at the article to classify. It will be like too much of, so I'm a bit uh, in this. I have to rely on a previous tag. So maybe um, if I use it to re-tag, maybe it will be different from website to website as well. But I'm not sure I can say what is the right tag in the end. Hi, I was just wondering, is there a particular motivation for using LSI over LDA, which is in the Jensen package as well? Uh, oh, no. I'm taking notes. Uh, no, not at all. So that's, uh, so at my company we mostly don't use Python, but when I came in there was a script for NLP done by a contractor that I had to refactor and that's how I actually, so oh, that's how we can get like topics and it was using TFIDF and LSI, so no, I didn't, no, do you think it will be more relevant to um, this kind of? Well, I mean, I'm no expert now. Mm. But um, my understanding of, uh, of the method you're using is it looks at word to word relevance and groups words together, whereas the LDA is going to look at latent topics which distribute those words over. Okay. So it uh, alleviates some of the ambiguity if words correlate together in different topics. Mm -hmm. Within LDA, you're going to have a distribution over, over the various topics it could be in. That might be more informative uh, okay. so rather than saying a particular word belongs to neuroscience mm -hmm. or uh, cell biology, you'd have a distribution over which one it belongs to, so it's not mutually exclusive. Oh, okay, yeah. Uh, I, I don't know if that. Mm -hmm. No, that's a good thing to test, I guess. Mm. Thank you. <laughs>